what's going on, everybody? What's happening? Happy Monday, start of the week. Oh, the Monday's over now. It is Monday, September the 11th, 2023, 6.07 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, 22 years ago today, the uh, attacks, uh, September 11th, the World Trade Center, Pentagon, that uh, field in uh, Pennsylvania. Hard to believe it's been 22 years. Where were you when it happened? Maybe you weren't even born. I don't know. Uh, I remember where I was. I was visiting, I was visiting some friends uh, back in the town where I went to college. Uh, crazy stuff, crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, hard to believe. Um, the Exorcist Believer has a new trailer. I'm about five days late. Or not, no, maybe I'm six days late, seven days. I don't know. I'm like a week late or something like that. The Exorcist, the Belie the Exorcist Believer uh, has uh, a new trailer that was out last week. And uh, we're going to talk about it uh, here today. I want to give my thoughts on it. And also something I didn't realize was out. Uh, and it was out like five days ago. Uh, and it comes, I learned this when I was reading about the trailer or, excuse me, I learned this when I was looking some stuff up about the trailer and I came across this bloody disgusting article, which I will read to you in a second here. Uh, we're not going to watch the video, but I just kind of want to bring it to your attention in case you're unaware of it. I'm going to watch it after this episode of McRae Live because uh, I kind of want to see if I had known about it before I had set up this show. I would have watched it beforehand and maybe made this part of the show. Uh, but nonetheless, I still think it's interesting. Okay. So, uh, the exorcist believer, we know that the second one is going to be deceiver. The third one is golden retriever. And it's just one of those things where somebody out there is going, is he fucking serious? <laughs> golden retriever, uh, Mike Seaver, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. No, um, believer, deceiver, redeemer. I don't know. So the exorcist, of course, as we know, one of the greatest horror films of all time. And when you're going to do a sequel to that movie, uh, it's big shoes to fill. And there's going to be a lot of hatred thrown at you unnecessarily by whiny little bitches online. And then there's going to be, uh, remember I said unnecessary hate thrown at you by whiny little bitches online. You know, you always get those people, right? And then you get people who are genuinely skeptical and concerned and can put actually two sentences together, two original thoughts together rather than glomming onto what other people are saying. Uh, and, you know, they can articulate why they're concerned. And, you know, I, I'm concerned about this. I don't know if we should be doing this, guys. And they lay out why and all that kind of stuff. You get those people. And that's great. Like, I, I totally, you know, I support that. It's a, it's those people that don't know their asses from their elbows. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> unsub um but you know what i'm a big fan of the exorcist as you guys know and and uh it's one of my favorite horror movies of all time and uh <laughs> yeah the slaughtered lab bieber that's right believer deceiver justin bieber it's it's a whole thing it's a whole thing these girls are possessed by Bieber and you realize that they were just obsessed with Justin Bieber and he's come into the, it's a whole thing. It's weird. It gets really weird anyway. So, um, but I, I have always been, you know, I always want movies to succeed. Of course I do. And, and, but I, I've, I've been very skeptical of this. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of David Gordon Green's Halloween trilogy, although there were many aspects of it in a vacuum that I liked. Uh, you know, like I like that story beat. Uh, I like that, you know, that sequence, those shots. Uh, I like this character, but not that. You know what I mean? It was kind of a hodgepodge for me at the end of the day. And for me, it ended on a whimper with Halloween ends. Although, I do really like the Corey Cunningham story. I just don't like it in this movie. You know what I'm saying? It was like, it was a weird, it's like a weird, weird thing. And uh, so he's doing The Exorcist and Blumhouse wants to do to The Exorcist what they did with Halloween. Legacy sequel. They're going to give you Believer. Uh, they've already announced the name for the sequel. So they, I would imagine they got to be pretty confident Look, 
even if this even if this thing is a dumpster fire of epic proportions, it's going to make bank at the box office at least opening weekend. It's being released on October. Actually, I think it was rolled it was rolled uh, up a bit to October s- the the week before because of the Taylor Swift thing. I think right. I think that was one of the movies that did that. Anyway, it's in October. It's spooky season, Halloween season, and uh, it's going to make bank. I mean, it's going to make a lot of money, especially its opening weekend. And we don't know wh- what kind of legs it's going to have. You know, that all depends on how good it is. But certainly, people are going to go out to see it because they want to see it. Uh, and it's horror and it's spooky season, Halloween time, horror movie time. You could put, I don't know, attack of the killer toothbrushes and release that in October. And it would make like, you know, 80 million at the box office. <laughs> People just want to see, <laughs> see horror movies. And I'm telling you right now, attack of the killer toothbrushes. Hey, who wants to see it? Who wants to see attack of the killer toothbrushes? You know what I'm saying? Uh, there's a lot of <laughs> weird things you could do with that too. But so, um, I am, uh, but as somebody who's a big fan of the original, it's one of my favorite horror movies of all time, I'm skeptical on this because because of the way that horror movies usually go. See, if A24 had, and this is no slight against Blumhouse, okay? If A24 had The Exorcist, I would be like, huh, okay. Now, why is that? Well, Generally speaking, A24 is delivering more of those cerebral, uh, you know, nuanced psychological horror films, right? You got Hereditary and and you got Midsommar and was The Witch A24? It might have been too, um, although I'm not sure. But, you know, you, you get a lot of those, okay? Blumhouse tends to be more of the every man's horror production company. And it's no knocking and say, hey, listen, I'd love to work. I'd Hey, listen, if Blumhouse was like, dude, you want to greenlit your idea? I'd be like, woohoo! You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm just saying that when you take a step back and you look at it, right? Generally speaking, Blumhouse is more of that, you know, everyday man's horror. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know, you throw everything in the kitchen sink. This is good. That's not. This is good. That's not. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like that. So, you just don't know what you're going to get. You know, you don't kind of know what exorcist movie you're going to get. We hear what they're saying. We know what they're saying. We get it, but not really sure. Do you know what I mean? And listen, I'm going to give you my thoughts on the trailer here in a second. But again, I'm prefacing my thoughts with this because I think it's important. Um, For those that might be new to my channel, who didn't watch my other, who have no idea what I think on the exorcist, I do think it's important. So, you know, I, I've been kind of like, because The Exorcist, the original Exorcist, it's not a slasher movie, it's not a blood, guts, and gore movie. It's a psychological horror film. That's what it is, really, at the end of the day. And it's a character-driven horror slash drama slash psychological film. Uh, it's not blood, guts, and gore. It's not, it really is about character, character, character. It's a character-driven film, not a plot-driven film. And it's like the original Jaws, Right? You know what I'm saying? And so, I, in today's climate, I'm just like, is Blumhouse going to deliver that? You know? Or are they going to be too, well, you know, we got we to gotta have that. We got to have this. We got to have, ha, no, no, hang on. Every good horror movie, it says the record shows, the stats show, this is what it shows. We got to have 13 jump scares. We got to have four false jump scares. We got, you know what I'm saying? You know, I'm just, this, the exorcist, this, this is not the Pope's exorcist here. You know what I'm saying? This is the exorcist, the granddaddy of all possession movies. And you're doing a direct sequel to that? Well, we know how that went last time. <laughs> the heretic. <laughs> Wasn't somebody flying around in a bumblebee or something? Anyway, uh, although The Exorcist 3, Legion, fantastic. Anyway, because it's more of that thing. So, you know, I've I've been there. That's where I am with my, I'm like, <sighs> the first trailer came out. They released the posters first, right? So that's, so, okay, you know, the poster, okay, we know a trailer's coming any minute. Like a, the day later, you know, a day later or something. I saw the posters and I was like, oh, okay. You know, I mean, it, I, I wasn't like, Whoa! but I, I wasn't like, man, I was kind of like, okay, interesting. I like the black and white. Um, and then the trailer dropped. And I, 
you know, it didn't do much for me. Uh, that And again, that doesn't mean The Exorcist is not going to be good. We've all seen great trailers to bad movies, bad trailers to great movies. I mean, it, it, it can happen. But the first trailer, I was like, eh, didn't really, didn't really do much for me. Um, it just felt very pedestrian, paint by numbers. You know, it just, it, it, it just, it didn't have that, you know, and I think that the body and the blood, the body and the blood, the body and the blood. I mean, that whole scene that I, I know what they're going for there. Um, I just don't, it, it's just, we're so desensitized now. As, like if, they, if that had been in the seventies, if you had released that scene in a 1970s horror film, the body right in the church, this little girl walks into the church and everybody's like, oh, and she's going, the body and the blood, the body and the blood, the body and the blood. I mean, that would today in 2023, that would be considered one of those iconic scenes in, in horror movie history. We would look back on, the, do you remember that movie? Remember that movie, 1975? That little girl, she walked into the church, dude, and she was like, the body in the blood, the body in the blood, the body was going, oh, yeah, fuck, oh, it was wild, it was wild, you know what I'm saying, it was wild, I mean, that's how we would look back at that, we would look back, but now we've seen so many things like that over the years, we see that and we just kind of go, oh yeah, that's the thing they're doing, oh yeah, they're doing that thing. You know what I'm saying? So it, it when that happened, I, I feel it's kind of like, eh, you know, it, it, it doesn't have the impact that you want it to have. Now, again, we haven't seen the movie. Maybe you watch the movie. It's like, whoa, that's a great scene. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Um, but I wasn't a real fan of it. Didn't like think it was a terrible trailer or anything. I just was like, eh, you know. So this trailer, I know, we're 13 minutes into this show. Talk about the trailer. This trailer. This is going to be a very unpopular thing to say because I've seen the response from people online. I liked this trailer better than the first trailer. Now, pay attention to what I'm saying. I liked this trailer better than the first trailer. I'm not saying the movie looks spectacular. I'm not saying that the movie's going to be good. I'm not saying that all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, that's not what I'm saying. I'm from a trailer perspective, cutting a trailer, putting it together, marketing. I looked at this and I watched it and it hit more for me than it did the first trailer. Having said that, are there a lot of things in there that things we've seen before? Yeah, yeah, there are. It's just the way the trailer is edited together and, and and especially how it begins, right? You know, we cut in and you hear boom. And you see, you know, the window and then we cut to, you know, inside the house and we're kind of tracking along the hall. And I'm just like, this is interesting. You know, I like sort of more of that slower, you know how I am, that slower kind of burn a little bit. I mean, as slow of a burn as you can get in a trailer, but just kind of that, that eeriness, the, the beginning of the trailer, I quite like, and, uh, and then moving along there. And then, you know, you hear the woman talking at the table there and she's talking and seeing the girls and all that. I, I just, it's, it's weird to say, because I know that the general consensus online is that it was a, at least from what I'm seeing, it was a dog shit trailer and it looks like crap and it looks like everything we've seen before. And they're not wrong. I mean, to say that there is an argument to be made there. You can say, it makes sense. Like I'm not sitting here going, what are you talking about? I thought it was phenomenal. I mean, not at all, not at all. Like I totally get why people feel that way. There was just something about the way the trailer uh that this trailer just hit better for me i just was like you know what i like this trailer better there was a couple of moments i thought were eerier uh there was a i forget now but there's a couple of beats that that was quite quite eerie um that i thought was that i thought was good um I think the problem that The Exorcist run, you know, runs into, hang on, actually, before I get to that, let me finish my thoughts. So overall, overall, I actually quite liked the trailer, but that doesn't mean that I think the trailer means that this trailer makes me think the movie's going to be good. Do you know what I mean? That the movie's going to be good. Um, that doesn't mean that. That doesn't mean that. Because um, it doesn't. Does it get me more excited for it? No, not really. I wouldn't say I'm more excited now than I was, 
you know, six weeks ago or five weeks ago or four, I forget when the other one came out. But at that time, no, not really. Um, because I still have my concerns uh, on whether or not this is going to be the film that that we want it to be uh, or that it should be. And that goes into my my thought, which is, you know, it because of the era we're in, because of the uh, where we are with horror, especially, because we've been so so saturated and desensitized with all these exorcism possession type of movies. This movie doesn't stand a chance really um, at, well, I take that back. Every movie has a chance, Um, but I'm talking about the, uh, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I just really hope this is a, that the film and the story is crafted in a way that it is a very uh, deep character driven film Um, because that's what the original Exorcist was. And uh, I worry that in today's day and age, uh, those things don't really fly anymore. Um, especially coming from a, like, again, especially coming from a production company like Blumhouse, uh, who is more about that mainstream populist type horror. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's more of that sort of mass produced horror than something like A24, which is more of that, you know, artsy fartsy, (laughs) you know, um, uh, highbrow, right. Horror. But that's but that is the Exorcist, you know. I, I hate to say it, folks, but it is, you know. It, it it's not. It, there, there's a reason why it, it it is still considered today to be one of the greatest horror films of all time. The, a reason why it stands up today, because it really is about the character and the drama and the relationships uh, that is happening. Like like I've often said, the 360 degree head turn, the fuck me, fuck me, fuck me, your mother sucks cocks in hell, the green slime, all that. Yeah, okay, that's great. I mean, that's, woohoo, great. That's fun. But without the, the actual, uh, 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 you know, the struggle that Damien is going through and Father Marin and then, you know, what the mother is going through and all, you know, all the, and and then because Friedkin, William Friedkin, rest in peace, he recently passed away, uh, because he c- comes from a documentary film background, right? There is a documentary style to the original Exorcist. It almost feels feels like a documentary without it being a documentary the way it's shot the pacing of it the slow burn seeing the discussions between the doctors and the and and the mother and 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 that and that and that dichotomy between faith and 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 religion and science and religion and uh, and watching it's like you're watching a really intense do- it's not a obviously it's not like a documentary like literally but but it has that documentary vibe to it a little bit. There's a little bit of that essence to it. And that's deliberate. That's on purpose. I even think Freakin has talked about that over the years. And it and it really does show the way it's paced. You know, you don't you don't uh, uh, peak too soon, you know, and you really milk things and you draw it out and you build to that. And and I'm not saying that David Gordon Green and Blumhouse haven't done that here. I'm just saying that that style of of horror movie coming from a mainstream studio like Universal and a mainstream production company like Blumhouse, we don't generally see that. Um, that's why A24, you know, A24 gets the, you know, they, they get made fun of, you know, sometimes like, oh, there is the highbrow horror movies. But, you know, some, yeah, but. They release some pretty good fucking stuff. And that's why I often think that maybe an Elm Street would be a good fit for something like A24, right? Dreams, the subconscious, you know what I'm saying? Something more of, of, of an A24, perhaps. I'm not saying for sure. I'm just saying that that I think an exorcist, you know, I don't want to walk away from the exorcist having it just have been another exorcism movie. Do you know what I mean? And and so I am worried about that. And I do see that in this trailer. I absolutely see it. There's things we've seen before 100%. 
It's just overall, I thought this was a better trailer. Now, there's a lot of people that disagree with me because I've seen it online. Wow, it's dog shit, fucking bullshit trailer. Same shit we've had. I'm just like, well, yeah, hey, you know what? Yeah, 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 I, I get it. I get it. But for me, and I've watched the trailer twice now, um, I just think as far as trailers go, I think it's a better trailer than their first one. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I call me weird, call call me strange, but but I do. I you know I do, and so my fingers are crossed that uh, that the movie is good. My fingers are crossed that, and again, it doesn't have to be spectacular, right? This is what we have to understand. They are they're behind the eight ball, okay? If The Exorcist believer is as good as Halloween 18, okay? Now, and you know me, I'm not a huge fan of Halloween 18. I think I gave it like a C plus, I think is what I gave it. You know what I mean? And that was like, you know, I mean, maybe if I, you know, were to watch it now, maybe I'd loosen up a little bit, maybe to a B minus, I don't know. Uh, but I haven't watched it in a long time. But, uh, but you know, there's lots of things I would have done differently that I think they should have done that they didn't do and all that kind of stuff. But it was critically well-received, generally speaking with the fans, generally, it was really well received and it made a lot of money at the box office. It was not resurrection. It was not Halloween five. It was not Rob zombie. Like, you know what I'm saying? It was like, this is the best sequel we've had in a long time. And so, and Halloween 18 isn't spectacular and incredible and amazing. So the exorcist believer doesn't have to be an, if it ends up being a knockout, that's great. But I feel personally, I don't know how you guys feel, but I I feel that I'm looking at this camera. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I feel that as long as we can maybe walk away from the theater going, you know, that was all right. That wasn't a disaster. It wasn't as good as the original. Of course not. Of course not. Anybody going in thinking, or anybody going in, in my estimation, that, that, that has that as the litmus test, and it has to meet that or exceed it, or it's dog shit, dude, you're part of the problem. Like, I'm just, I'm just saying. Like, I'm, it's wonderful you have high standards, and that's great. I think we should all have, you know, a certain level of, but I mean, come on. It's the way that I thought about the Indiana Jones movie, right? You know I mean, so many years later, you know, I'm just like, it's not going to be Raiders, Templar, Last Crusade. So as long as I can walk out of there going, you know what? That was all right. I had a good time. Then it's a win, right? And and I kind of feel that way about most legacy sequels now. I think I, like, I'm really tempering my expectations because I understand the climate we're in now, the era we're in now, especially for the genre of horror. And, you know, what, what worked 40, 50 years ago isn't really working today. The studios aren't doing that kind of thing unless you're outside. Because I don't even think A24 is part of the AMPTP. I don't even think A24 is part of, uh, is, 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 yeah, I think A24 can still go ahead with the SAG waivers, which is what we're in the middle of of doing. Bruce and I are new members of the CMPA here in Canada, which is the Canadian Media, Media Producers Association. Uh, so we've we've applied for uh, a waiver as well because we we need we're not part of the AMPTP either. And I don't think A24 is funny enough. I think I read somewhere. Now that doesn't mean they won't be eventually, but I don't think they are right now. Funny enough. But anyway, um, I just think that that it's that it's important that that. I don't know, like, it's not that I don't want it to be like The Exorcist. I just don't know if it's possible today. With today's climate, with, you know, decisions being made by committee and, and and you know, I don't know. How much creative freedom did David Gordon Green have on this? I don't know. Um, or he could have had all the creative freedom in the world and we just don't like his creative decisions. That's entirely possible too. But I'm... I'm rooting for it. I'm hoping it's good. It doesn't have to be spectacular. It doesn't have to be the best thing since The Exorcist. It just has to be good. Hey, you know what? That was actually pretty good. I actually enjoyed that. That was not a disaster. You know, you walk out of, you know what? That was, it was good. I enjoyed it. I'd go see it again. That was really good. Well done. Now, does that mean... 
deceiver and golden retriever are going to be who, who knows but uh but i think that's where our expectations should be going in and going okay it's not going to be the exorcist if it ends up being the exorcist well that's bonus that's bonus but let's just go in and hope for good let's go in and hope for good not great if it is great that's great but let's go and hope for good you know like a six and a half seven out of ten hey you know what that's good that's good if this thing wound up with a 65 or 70% on Rotten Tomatoes, that's fucking spectacular for a horror movie. That's incredible. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's amazing. You know, like really, if you think about it, right? Anyway, let me jump over to the other screen here because I want to uh, read this to you. This comes from Bloody Disgusting. Uh, I didn't realize this is a video, but uh, you can check it out now on YouTube. The Exorcist Believer, David Gordon Green, breaks down the new trailer in 10-minute video. Thank you, John Squires. Um, so it just says here, uh, the brand new second trailer for The Exorcist Believer just debuted yesterday, and now Fandango has teamed up with director David Gordon Green for a closer look at the trailer. In the 10-minute video you'll find below, David Gordon Green dissects this uh, latest trailer for The Exorcist Believer, uh, providing insights and teasing uh, what to expect this October. I don't know how I didn't see this. Then again, the whole Dylan's new nightmare thing was, was pretty um, taking up a lot of my a lot of my time. Uh, do, 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 do. Gordon Green discusses Ellen Burstyn's return and oop. oh, hang on a sec. Why is it doing that? Oh wait, oh, I don't know why it's doing that. I don't want to exit. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, Gordon Green discusses Ella, Ellen Burstyn's return and Linda Blair's role on the production while also previewing the film's makeup effects, themes, and use of iconic tune. The Exorcist Believer centers on the idea of what Gordon Green calls... <laughs> Okay, I guess the page is unresponsive, but I can still scroll. Uh, the Exodus Believer centers on the idea of what uh, Gordon Green calls synchronized possessions. And he also says it's about both community and life-changing choices. I mean, just hearing that, I dig the plot. Like, I dig... I. Like, I like that idea. I don't know if we've seen that before. You know, like a double possession, synchronized possession. That's interesting. That's fascinating. That's new. I like. I like that idea. That's interesting you know, about community and life choices. Okay, so based on, you know, the word community and life-changing choices, excuse me, that's where the character and the drama should come in. So this should be a, there should be a real character-driven element to this plot, I would imagine. Take a closer look at the new trailer in Fandango's video below. David Gordon Green directed the brand new sequel to The Exorcist for Universal Blumhouse and Morgan Creek that will pave the way for a new trilogy. This uh, first film in the trilogy will now release, yeah, will now be released theatrically on October the 6th with Leslie Odom Jr. starring. Here's the, the plot synopsis. Since the death of his pregnant wife in a Haitian earthquake 12 years ago, Victor Fielding uh, has raised their daughter, Angela, on his own. But when Angela and her friend, Catherine, disappear in the woods, only to return three days later with no memory of what happened, it unleashes a chain of events that will free that, that will force Victor to confront uh, the uh, confront the the nader of e the nader. I think that's how you say that. Uh, of evil and in his terror and desperation seek out the only person alive who has witnessed anything like it before Chris McNeil Ellen Burst and there's the, the video there so that's kind of cool that's kind of cool I uh, didn't know this uh, video existed so uh, yeah uh, I'm gonna check it out after the um, after the stream here today but I think that's pretty cool I think it's pretty cool and and uh, I want to check it out and get some more insights but yeah listen you know what I liked the trailer <laughs> you know I I didn't I'm not saying it's it's it makes me think the movie's gonna be great I'm just saying that as far as trailers go um, and maybe I maybe I would have liked it less had I really liked had this been the first trailer it's entirely possible that because I thought the first trailer was underwhelming, that maybe that's why I think this trailer, like it's not, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the trailer's spectacular. I'm just saying that in my opinion, in comparison to the the first one, I think it's a better, stronger trailer personally. Um, and, but whether the movie's going to be good or not, I don't know, man. I have no idea. I mean, there's definitely a lot of tropey, traditional pedestrian things we see in that trailer but hey you know what my fingers are crossed 
I'm rooting for it, man. I am. I am. I, I want every movie to succeed. You know, I'm not like these culture war channels that spend day in and day out hoping and wanting and praying that something does actually fail. Uh, I, I'm not like that. <laughs> uh, but hey, all power to them, man. So anyway, let's jump over to the uh, the chat room here and see what you are all saying. Uh, I see Happy Sanjo became a member again. Thank you, Happy. Great to see you back. Great to see you back. Uh, and we got a couple super chats that came in. Andrew Stevens sends in $10. Thank you, Andrew, and says, for anyone who is considering to become a member or upgrade to level number two, we had a blast yesterday Yesterday, doing one good scare. Come on over and enjoy the perks of being a, U, a, a YT member. Remember to crunch one out. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, one of our great moderators here on the channel. And of course, uh, one of our great channel members. Yes, last night. Yeah, if you want to become a channel member here on the channel uh, and get access to exclusive perks and uh, shows and all that kind of stuff, the, uh, the link is pinned to the top of the chat. Check it out. There's two tiers. Um, and yeah, last night or yesterday afternoon, we had our first, uh, one good scare, which is the all Halloween show called one good scare. It's exclusive to my level two members. And, uh, we discussed sort of where the franchise is, where we want it to go. What do we think should happen? And we had a, an entire discussion around Charlie Bowles and what you could do with that and where it could go. And man, did it get dark? It got dark. It was a great episode. Really great episode. First strong episode out of the gate. Uh, there's also Horror Movie Nights, which is a show I do uh, at the end of every month um, on Saturday night where we watch a horror movie together. Uh, and of course, there's members only live streams and emojis and, and, and badges and uh, giveaways. Uh, I had my first giveaway last week, I guess it was. Uh, so yeah, and I've only had this for like a month. So uh, we're just getting started here. But if you want to show some support to the channel, that's one way of doing it. Uh, like I said, there's two tiers. Click the link at the top of the chat and check it out and come on over because it is, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun for sure. Uh, Josh McKenna sends in 1999. Thank you, Josh, for the very generous super chat and says, do you plan on exchanging gifts on the set of chapter two? If so, I have a gift idea for Victoria. Amazon sells gigantic goose pillows. <laughs> you should get one for her. Do you still tease Victoria about the goose? Uh, I, it's a very, very good idea. Uh, I was talking to Victoria actually the other day. Um, uh, not, not on a regular basis, of course, because, you know, it's not the, the topic of discussion, but have we teased Victoria since she told us about that, about the goose? Yes. Yes, we have. We have. Yeah. That's not a bad idea for a gift. I'm just saying that's not a bad idea for a gift. I think she'd like that. Actually. I think she'd, she'd totally be down for that. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Josh. Really appreciate the super chat, uh, very much. Uh, okay. Was it just those two super chats? I believe it was, uh, let me just see here. Um, oh no, hang on a sec. Oh, there we go. Okay. My, my, okay. Hang on. There we go. Uh, I believe it was just those to, uh, yes, it was just those two. Just those two. Okay. Just want to make sure it was just those two. Um, let me see here. Uh, Karen Spruce says, I was pretty happy with the Halloween trilogy, so I have hope for David Gordon Green for sure. There you go. There you go, man. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Love it. Movie fan says, uh, come people buy the double, uh, can people buy the double blues so we can see Dave? Oh, come on, people buy the double blues so we can see Dave sit on his ass for eight hours. Uh, on the 28th of October. Yes, that's right. Hey, listen, as I've said, um, the It's Me Billy Chapter 2 campaign is in demand. The link is in the description. Uh, I've put the double blue perk as a featured perk. So when you go to the Indiegogo campaign, it'll be the first perk that you see. It'll see featured. And if we can get the total up to 303 total sold uh, and sell off the last two remaining associate producer perks, because like I said, there's only two associate producer perks left. And we're going to be pushing this as we get further into September and, in, and into the spooky season. I'm going to be doing some streams and really pushing this because I, you know what, I, I, I want to do it. I want to give everybody the opportunity to help make it happen. Uh, and of course, you know, if you pick up, if you haven't picked up a perk yet, when you do, you'll get your name in the end credits of It's Me Billy Chapter 2. Uh, that's just a natural default for, by any perk that you pick up. So uh, yeah, the link is in the description and uh, the campaign is still there. Hoodies, t-shirts, posters, Blu-rays, 
you know, uh, producer credits. It's all there. Check it out. Um, if you want to be a part of this thing, because we're in, we're in pre-production right now. And, uh, you know, things are very stressful and crazy, but uh, we're moving forward and, and things are, are going well. Things are going well. So yes, by all means, check it out. Uh, the double blue perk is the perk where you get both chapter one and chapter two on Blu-ray together. So, um, and it's the featured perk right now on the campaign. Uh, and like I said, there's two associate producer perks left. That's it. We had a total of 15 We've sold off 13. So we have 13 associate producer per uh 13 associate producers, which is awesome. And now we just want to sell off two more. So uh and there's still four, four, three or four, um executive producer perks available. So you can check that out too. Now they are the higher tier. They are a a a uh, uh uh you know higher tiered perk, of course, but with a higher tiered perk, you get you know higher tier things. So uh, yeah, don't forget to check that out, guys. If 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 we can sell off, if we can get to three hundred and three double blue per double blues sold, and sell off the last remaining two associate producer perks on Saturday, October the twenty eighth, I will sit here on this YouTube channel and watch Halloween one two three four five back to back to back to back to back to back to back giveaways, guests, I, in one big epic Halloween stream. If we don't meet it, I don't do it. That's the deal, right? That's the deal. So, um, and remember that money doesn't go into my pocket and I go off and, you know, spend it on like, you know, a vacation to Hawaii or something. No, that, that money, it's for a good cause. It doesn't go to me. It goes into the business account for, uh, our production company and it goes, it gets put towards the movie. So, uh, so it goes to a good cause too, right? So it's a win-win on both fronts. Movie chat and more part two sends in two pounds says I can't help but think this I can't help but think this more blum wokeness. Um I'm not quite I mean I I understand I, I don't quite know what you mean, Richard. Uh I can't help but think this more blum wokeness. You can't help but think that the exorcist believer is more blum wokeness? I I don't know what particularly you're getting that's woke about it, but uh, hey, hey, we all see different things, right? Rob Thinoff says, Dave, did you watch Silver Spoons as a kid in the 80s like me? I started watching it again on Tubi and it was better than I remember. It really captured the 1980s perfectly. Uh, no, I never did. I know, I know what you're talking about, but I never did. I never did. I should watch some of those. I should watch some of those. No, in the 80s, I was, I, I, I was watching ALF and, and uh, Three's Company. Of course, it ended in 84, but uh, Family Ties, Cosby Show, Growing Pains, He-Man, you know, who's the boss? Uh, yeah, no, I didn't watch Silver Spoons. I did not watch Silver Spoons. Um, I mean, I'm just, I'm just going to sc scroll back here for a second because I'm curious what people are th saying about the trailer. Uh, Tarman Slasher 92 says, A24 makes me think of words like pretentious, preachy, and murky. And I can understand how, how somebody could feel that way. Um, you know, but I, I, I think it's important that we understand that there are movies that are definitely, and I'm not saying A24 films, I'm talking about movies in general, okay? There are definitely movies out there that exist that are movies that are very, um, you know, self-deprecating and, uh, you know, the filmmakers, the directors, the writers are just smelling their own farts, right? You know, pretentious, condescending, you know, all that kind of stuff. For sure, for sure. Um, but I also think it's important to remember that, and I'm not saying you, I'm just, again, I'm speaking in generalities here. I think it's important to remember that just because a movie is maybe highbrow or a little cerebral doesn't mean that it's pretentious and doesn't mean that it's, uh, what's the other word you used? Uh, preachy, right? Um, I think it's important that we understand that there are, and again, I'm not talking about you. I'm just saying in a general sense, there are certain people that, that will always like that kind, those kinds of movies, not because they are that way, uh, but because the writing is very good. And the writing is nuanced and it, it's not out 
It's not out. It, it doesn't appeal to a mass audience. It appeals to a particular audience. Uh, and that will always be that way. And there's a variety of reasons for that. We have to understand that, you know, we all, we all have different life experiences. We all have different education levels. We're all different ages. We all have different things we're into, right? You know, there are certain stories in movies, horror films and otherwise, that that will be a little more uh, cerebral or highbrow, if you will, that will always appeal to somebody who, and I hate to say it like this, um, but I, I'm, I'm going to be blunt just so it, it makes the point, um, you know, will always appeal to certain people that are wiser and smarter than maybe the average moviegoer who's not really into that stuff. They don't think about that stuff. They're not well read. They don't read about that kind of stuff. They don't understand the simil the symbolism and the cinematic language of of you know religious text or or symbols or mythology and all that kind of stuff. Right? Like there's so many things you can use religion and mythology and all that kind of stuff to be able to help propel a plot forward in fascinating and interesting ways that is very nuanced and subliminal and under the radar. And it gets people very excited who know it, who understand it, who are well-read or, you know, whatever the case is. But the average person doesn't really know about that stuff. Now, I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying that I am one of those people, that I'm just, I'm one of those people that, that is an, uh, I just understand, not at all. Not at all. I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I think there's some movies that are more cerebral that I really like and that I totally get because I might be maybe a little more well-read or into that than the average person. And then there's some movies that I watch where I'm like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. It's even above, it's well above my pay grade. Like just, I'm just like, like, I want to like this. I feel like I should like this, but I don't even know what the fuck they're talking about. You know, you know what I'm saying? We've all had that, right? And you, you know, the movie's smart. You know, the writing's good. You feel like you should like it. You want to like it, but you just don't. (laughs) <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because it's not for you. It's not for you, right? So like there's there's different levels and, and, and that really comes down to the writing and, and how it, uh, you know, and the execution and all that kind of stuff. And A24, very early, they, they've established themselves as, as a production company or as a studio, I guess they really are too, um, that, that specializes in more of that, that uh, approach to storytelling right? Rather than just like a movie like, you know, Freaky, you know, or Halloween, you know what I mean? That doesn't mean that there, there isn't, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, symbolism in those movies, but they're not, uh, they're not highbrow movies, right? You know what I mean? They're not, they're, they're movies that everybody can enjoy. Everybody can watch. Everybody can understand. Everybody can get, no matter what level you're, you know, you know, you're ticking at, right? And, uh, but we have to, you know, understand that, that the world is full of different people and and different levels of education and different levels of understanding of of different topics and and it is true that if you want to become a really good screenwriter um and I don't I'm not pretending to say that I'm a really good screenwriter I'm just saying if you want to become one um it is true that having a real like and and you 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 want to become a real good screenwriter in like science fiction or horror or, and, and, and I mean beyond like the slasher subgenre, right? Like, I mean like real sort of like, you know, like the A24 kind of horror. If you want to become, and, and science fiction, oh my God. Having a real good understanding of mythology and symbolism and religion. And I mean, George, like you look at Star Wars, right? And, 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 if you listen to interviews with George Lucas, that man knows religion. It's all over Star Wars. And there's and and he, because of his understanding, he's able to write stories that he knows is going to appeal to a mass audience and they don't even know why because he's tapping into them uh, into their subconscious through emotions and symbolism and cinematic language and all that kind of stuff. And it it's and and that takes great writing. Like you, you can't just sit down and write that. You have to under you as the writer have to understand that. You have to understand what you're doing and how you affect your audience. And then you have to get a good director who knows how to take that material and 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 help to realize it, right? And all that kind of stuff. So um so but 
I do get what you're saying, 100%. But I think it's also fair to say that uh, that they have produced some really good films. And just because, and I'm in the boat here too, just because you don't understand it or don't get it doesn't mean that it's not a really smartly written film. It just means that, you know, it's it's above your pay grade. And listen, there's movies that are above my pay grade too. Like, there are. There's movies, there, there are movies above, above everybody's pay grade, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, just like, I don't really, I don't, I don't really get it. I don't really, I've, I've done that before. I'm like, I don't really understand that. You know, I gotta, I gotta watch it again, you know? And then I watch it again. I'm like, I don't think I really understand that. You know what I mean? And you want to so bad, but you know, and then you watch like a explained video and you're like, oh yeah, I get, yeah, no, I wouldn't have gotten that because I didn't know about that or whatever the case is, right? And again, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking in a general sense, but yeah, but no, I get it. I get it. They are known for that. They are known to be more of that cerebral style. You know what I'm saying? For sure, for sure. Um... All right, uh, let me scroll down here. Going on, going on, going on. Uh, did I miss any Super Chats? I don't think I did. I think it was just the, the two that came in, right? I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything or the three that came in. Oh, no, that's not showing up there. I think it was just the three that came in. Um, ba 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 Viva La France says, Barry Lyndon is a perfect example of a masterpiece that doesn't appeal to general movie-going audiences. It's excellent if you're into visual storytelling and philosophy, but it falls flat for most. Great example. Most of Kubrick's film, well, yeah, I'd say most, not all of them, but certainly most. I mean, 2001, right? I mean, that's a film that's, that's you know, I, I think there's enough in 2001 that it does appeal to, uh, to you know, to, you know, it can appeal to certain general movie going audiences, but it certainly is, uh, I mean, it's, it, 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 there's a cerebral psychological angle to it for sure. Um, and I remember, see, this is the perfect example. I remember when I first watched 2001, my dad rented it for me. I was probably like, I don't know, 12, 13, something like that. And I remember my dad was like, son, you got to watch this movie. That's, that's, it's what does it mean? It's the bigger, the philosophical questions, you know. I'm like, okay, Dad. So uh, he didn't watch it with me, though. I th- he probably had to go write a column or something. But anyway, so I'm on the couch and I'm watching this. And as you know, if you've seen 2001, A Space Odyssey, for the first, like, you know, what feels like 15 to 20 minutes of that movie is a bunch of apes, you know, and and all this stuff going on with our, and I remember as, as a kid thinking, oh, fuck, like what? I, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get what's, you know, I don't get it. You know what I mean? Now, mind you, I'm a kid. So maybe that's a bit of a, it's a bad example to what I was talking about earlier, but the principles are the same. And I, did, I didn't get it. And then we got into it a bit more and we went along. And, and I remember thinking, man, it's very slow. You know, I didn't, it's kind of slow. And, you know, and then at the end of the movie, I, I, I liked I really, I, I like the idea of like, what does the ending mean and all that? But I didn't love it. I was young, but I didn't love it. I watched it again when I was in college. Loved it. Loved it. Got it. I'm older. I'm wiser. You know what I mean? And, and I, I got it. It clicked. You know, uh, New Nightmare was like that. When I watched New Nightmare, when it came out in 1994, I was 15. You know, the whole meta, everybody playing fictionalized versions of themselves. And I was like, what the fuck is this? What is this shit? You know what I'm saying? I thought that. I remember renting it. 1994, I was 15. I rented it. Well, I probably didn't rent it because you probably had to be 18. But, uh, oh no, I probably did. I probably did. Because I I was 15 and I looked like I was, you know, 38. Uh, (laughs) It's true. I didn't know, but I sounded, I sounded like I did. But anyway... And I remember just not, and then of course, years later, I watched it again. I'm like, oh, I get it. You know, I understand it. Um, but you are right. You are right. This is, but it's just, it's just the reality. It's look, we, as I've said, we've all lived different lives. We all have different levels of education and different levels of interests. If you don't have a natural built-in interest to read or to read, uh, or just to, 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 
topics, just like, you know, like, again, I'm not a scholar. I don't even have a college education. I dropped out of college, right? I went to film school. My second year, things, got, I, I learned a lot, don't get me wrong, but I, I things got too crazy. It was it's all this workload and I, you know, I dropped out, right? And so I don't have a college education. I have a high school education, I have a college education, but I'm inquisitive like my father was. And, and so I'm very into uh, certain topics, you know, certain topics that may be deemed a little highbrow. But I know I'm not smart enough to know everything about it. And sometimes I'll watch like videos on like, you know, I don't know, uh, just, I can't think of anything off the top, but, but just like real, like, you know, philosophical things, right? You know, you're watching and like, maybe the video is an hour long and I understand 30 minutes of it, but I'm really into it. You know what I mean? I'm trying to, but there's lots of people that don't spend a lick of their life even doing that. There are people that just their lives are literally, and there's nothing wrong with this. Not one is better than the other or right or wrong. It's just the way the cookie crumbles with different people in different interests. There's people that don't spend a lick, don't give a fuck about that, don't give a shit about those kind of movies. They just want to watch horror, blood, guts, and gore, horror, Freddy, yeah, Jason, and that's it. They don't care. They they don't spend time thinking about it. They don't think about symbolism and cinematic language. Cinematic language. Language. What does that even mean? I've never even heard of that. They don't care, nor do they have to, nor do they have to, right? They don't care. They don't care. They're too busy just, you know, doing their thing, man, just doing their thing. So um, everybody's different, right? So, so yeah, when a movie comes along that is cerebral or considered highbrow, yeah, you'd watch that and go, it's not my jam. I, I don't get it. You know what I mean? And, and, and that's okay. There's nothing like literally because there's lots of movies that I've watched, like I said, that I don't get. So um, you're right. Yeah. It's just, we all got to understand that it, it's different strokes for different folks, right? It doesn't mean you're stupid. It doesn't mean you would only be stupid if you studied this stuff and you should know this stuff, but you, but you ignorantly choose not to. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, then... Well, well, then, yeah, you're stupid. But not having a natural interest in something and not getting something, that doesn't mean you're stupid. That, that, that's not stupid. So don't, don't let anyone ever tell you that if you don't get it or whatever. You're just not into it. You're, you, you never spent the time to really understand what this type of storytelling is all about. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Alex Shambox, uh, one of our great members, says, Dave, why do you believe studios like A24 have agreed to the terms of the sag after strike no problem, whereas the major studios uh, who likely make more money appear unwilling to even negotiate? Well, I don't believe, I stand to be corrected on this, Alec, but I thought that A24 wasn't part of the AMPTP. Um, let me just see here. Are they part of it? Well, there's a Reddit thread that says A24 isn't part of the AMPTP, but you know, it's Reddit. I mean, you gotta be, <laughs> you gotta be careful. Um, okay, so this Reddit thread just says, recently sag after I provided approval to 39 independent productions to film during the strike after confirming they were not tied to the AMPTP. This list includes two A24 movies, Mother's, Mother Mary, starring Anne Hathaway, and uh, and Death of a Unicorn starring Paul Rudd and Jenna Ortega. This is because A24 is not connected to the AMPTP. So that would be why. It's the same thing right now that Bruce and I are trying to do um, with It's Me, Billy, Chapter 2. So Bruce and I have our own production company. Uh, we're part of the CMPA here in Canada, which is the Canadian Media Producers Associ Association. It's basically the equivalent, the Canadian equivalent of, of the AMPTP. And, uh, but obviously we're not on strike up here. ACTRA is not on strike. ACTRA is the Alliance of Canadian, ACTRA is the Alliance of Canadian Television Radio Artists. It's the Canadian equivalent of SAG-AFTRA. Um, and so, but with Olivia Hussey, who is a SAG-AFTRA member, of course, uh, we need to, which we've already done. We're in waiting now. Uh, hopefully we can get it 
ready to go before we want to go to camera. If not, well, the reality is we're just going to have to push the production. Um, this is just the realities of, of, uh, of this kind of thing. But we have, uh, we are in a position because uh, we are not associated with the AMPTP. So we are not who SAG is striking against. We are a true, independent, completely separate production uh, like A24. Um, so we are looking for approval, uh, a SAG waiver that will allow Olivia to work on our project, uh, during the strike. If, if they resolve it before we go to camera, like in the next, you know, couple of months, great. That doesn't look like that's going to happen. So either we're going to get the waiver, which we should get it. The question is, are we going to get it in time is the question. Um, uh, and if not, then, well, we have to push. I mean, that's just the reality. That's, that's just the reality. Um, that's why this is really unfortunate. It does affect, it does affect independent, independent productions like ours in the sense of, uh, there's a, there's a weight, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty tricky. So, um, but yeah, but that would be why is that A24 is not part of the AMPTP. Now they could become a part of the AMPTP. Uh, they could, um, and they might eventually, I don't know, but that's my understanding is that A24 had some productions that were already sort of like ready to go and they applied for that waiver. And because they're A24 and they probably have a little more clout than we do, they probably got their approval fairly quickly, <laughs> especially with, you know, Anne Hathaway and Paul Rudd attached in their two movies. You know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, that, that would be my understanding. Daniel Hyrell sends in 499 says, Dave, I'm still amazed by how much we came together to make IMB2 a reality. Dude, you and me both. I'm not even a Black Christmas fan, just an OG McCray fan. God bless. Man, I appreciate that, man. I since it's it's wild, isn't it? It's wild that this community stepped up. And like I said, the campaign is still, we are in demand now. So please tell your friends, spread I, I, hey, we're as I said earlier, we're getting into spooky season now. I'm going to be doing some fundraising, not like in the same ways as before, but I mean like a fundraising stream or two just to see if I can sell off those things so I can get that epic Halloween stream going. Um, but it's in demand. And, and that's wonderful because that means we can continue to raise a little bit more money for the production, which is great. And with everything going on right now in the world with productions, I tell you, we could use it. And so that's good. Um, and it allows you to reach more people right? Reach more people who don't know about it and all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, no, we're very excited. It's, it's, it's very exciting. And, and, and the fact that this community stepped up and raised, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars U S over 140,000 Canadian minus Indiegogo's percentage, which they also take. Uh, but nonetheless, we did so well. And this community stepped up and showed that, listen, there were black Christmas fans that donated. There were non-Black Christmas fans, you know, like yourself that are like, listen, dude, I recognize your passion. I'm not a big fan of the movie, but hey, I admire what you're doing. Like you're going for it. I admire that dude. I love your channel. I'm going to buy a Blu-ray, man. Or, or you know, I'm going to pick this up or, you you know, whatever the case is. And you did that. And I, and I have no doubt that others um, did as well. And then you have the Black Christmas fans that stepped up as well. Um, it's just, it's, it, it, like I said, it's it's a truly humbling experience to to see that happening. Um, it's, it's wild. And you guys got us greenlit. You guys got us into in demand. Um, I mean, our goal, and I've said this, our goal is to go to camera at the end of November. That's when we want to go to camera. But we have to have the waiver first to allow Olivia to work on on our film. And so our, if we don't get it before then, we're going to have to push it. Now, the release date of October 11th, uh, 2024 is still, is still intact. If we needed to push the film... It sucks because I wanted to have a teaser at Christmas, um, but it's out of our hands. If we need to push the film, then then we would push it probably from November to probably January or February is when we'd push it. Give us a few more months to see if we can get the waiver at the very least. Again, the strike doesn't have to be over. We hope the strike is because that means that uh, SAG and and you know the WGA feel respected and 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 uh, and the, the, you know and everything's good, right? But as long as we can get that waiver, 
which will allow Olivia to work on our project, and we are truly independent, not associated with the MPTP, that should be, you know, it, it should not be an issue. It's just, are we going to get it in time before we want to go to camera? So, um, but, but, but the fact that, that this community stepped up and made this a reality and made this happen is, is remarkable and, and truly incredible. And, and we thank you so, so much for this opportunity. Without you, this wouldn't be happening. I mean, the fact that we are able to submit to SAG and get this going, and I, I was talking to our props department the other day, props are starting to come in. It's pretty cool, pretty cool, pretty cool. Anyways, I can't say anything, but I'm just saying, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're, we're beginning to assemble the crew and things, it's all happening again because of you. We wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't because of you because we wouldn't have the money to do it, right? You know what I'm saying? You know, we wouldn't have the money to do it, right? It's That's why we're crowdfunding. I mean, you know, maybe if we could make money from this, Bruce and I would try and pool together some of our own money uh, and, and make a little, you know, 10 minute short, you know, or something like that. Because if we own the IP, because then we could make money from that and make it back. But with this, with, the, with an IP you can't make money from, crowdfunding is the best way to go. It's the best way to go because it helps us out. We get the money we need to make the movie and you guys get to see the movie made and you get your name in the credits and you get Blu-rays and hoodies and t-shirts and posters and all that kind of stuff, right? So it's a it's a win-win at the end of the day. And, and it's a great way to crowdfund IPs that you also own too, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that it's, it's particularly uh, great for fan films because you know, uh, nobody's really out of pocket, if you know what I mean. Like the donors obviously are spending money, but they're getting something for it, right? You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, but man, I mean, this community's fucking amazing. Like you guys are fucking amazing, sincerely. I mean, when we knew we had to ask for what we had to ask for and what our stretch goals were and all that, we thought, well, hey, it's what we need. We need it for this reason. We need it for that reason. We need to fly, you know, Olivia in. We need to put people up. We got to put her in the movie. We got to put this person in the movie. We're now a union production. Don't forget that, right? It's Me Billy Chapter 1 was a non-union production. It's Me Billy Chapter 2 is a full-scale union production. So with that, the cost goes, <laughs> it's massive. It goes way up. Uh, so we were like, well, if, if, if we're going to do it, this is how we got to do it. And we're going to, we're, we're going to, if we're going to go down, we're going to go down fighting. And we went and we swung and you guys fucking stepped up to the plate and you made it happen. You made it happen. It's amazing. It's amazing. So yeah, if you want to get in on horror history and black Christmas history and you haven't already, the link to the It's Me Billy Chapter 2 campaign is in the description. It's of course the direct sequel to the uh, film that I did a couple years ago. It's Me Billy uh, which is on my um, YouTube channel. If you haven't checked it out, just YouTube It's Me Billy. It'll come up. It is the uh, uh, direct sequel to the original Black Christmas. High production value, totally uh, professional, top to bottom indie horror film. It's a fan film, but very much like, you know, the Never Hike Alone films and uh, and uh, Dylan's New Nightmare and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's professional through and through. So if you haven't seen it and you've never heard of it and you're a big Black Christmas fan, please check it out and hopefully you'll like what we're doing and you'll like what we've set up and you'll want to help support us in the campaign that's currently in demand right now in the link below. Um, -da 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 -da. Daniel Voices Comics says, wow, dude, I didn't know it's Union. Yeah, oh yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, chapter two is, not chapter one. So uh, chapter one was non-Union, chapter two is Union. Everybody in the, because... Everybody that was in chapter one who wasn't union is now union. So it forced us to go union. And of course, if you want to bring on Olivia Hussey, you have no choice. So, um, and we knew that. We knew that. Now, I mean, I'm used to dealing with the union here in Canada, obviously as a voice actor, from the voice acting perspective. Um, but uh, dealing it from the other perspective in terms of making a movie and, and you know, from that perspective, um, you know, there's certain things that are the same, but the... Uh, but it's a bit different. You know, a, a lot of things, like I said, there's a lot of things that we've had to do and, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, but it's all positive. It's all good stuff. It's all positive. And the fact of the matter is that if you want to have any sort of, if you want to have, I mean, that's not true. You don't have to have, you, you can have a career making non-union movies. Sure. But if you want to play with the big boys, if you want to have any chance at playing with the big boys on any certain level, 
you have to go union. I mean, at some point you got to go union. Bruce and I opened up our own production company. I'll have more on that very soon. Uh, we had to join you know, the CMPA, as I said. Uh, lots of things we've had to do behind the scenes. And Bruce has just been a rock star. He's been an absolute rock star at, at handling, handling a lot of the production manager side of things uh, with this project. He's just been, you know, fantastic and getting certain things done. And of course I'm handling other sides of things and, um, it's been, it's been great, but yeah, no, we are a full scale union shoot. So, uh, with that obviously comes a lot of things that we have to, you know, abide by and, 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 and handle. And, and, and there are certain things that are out of our hands, uh, such as if we do not get the waiver that, that approves Olivia Hussey to work on our film by the time we want to go to camera, we can't go to camera unless we want to go to camera without her. And we don't want to do that. So the option then is, well, we have to push. And hopefully we don't have to push that long and we get the waiver and hey, we're ready to go. Great. You know what I mean? So fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Keep those fingers crossed, ladies and gentlemen. Keep those fingers crossed. Keep those fingers crossed. Uh, let me see here. Um... Uh, oh, hang on. What's going on here? Michael Caputo. Uh, I'm not sure what you're saying. Everybody, we're, we're all, let's, let, let, let's not have a fight. Children, children. <laughs> let's not have a fight, folks. Let's all kind of, if Michael Caputo is just expressing that he didn't like a horror movie or that he thinks something is, he thinks it's crap or something like that, or he loves a particular horror movie, Michael is allowed, he's allowed to express that without any sort of, making fun of or character attacks. This is not a chat room or a channel where, where, where we attack somebody's character, all right? We don't call somebody an idiot or a fucking loser or, you know, whatever. I'm not saying that's what happened here. I'm just l reminding people, okay? This is not what it's about, all right? All right, let's, let's, you know, okay? Let's just calm down, calm down. Calm down, folks. Um, all right. Harry Hagen, my man. Harry Hagen says, hey, Dave, who would you blame more for a performance, an actor or the director? Example, would you blame Busta for his performance in Resurrection or Rick Rosenthal, who allowed him to act like that in the film? Well, you know, I mean, it depends, right? I mean, you know, Busta Rhymes isn't an actor, so there's only so much that he can do uh, that he would have been able to do. Um, I think it's a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. I think when you have a talented actor and, uh, the, you know, something they do just isn't, do you know what I mean? Then to me, that's probably down to direction, um, down to communication and, uh, uh, being able to effectively articulate to your actor, uh, where they are, what's their motivation, what's happening, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and if you have a talented actor, then they should be, they will and should be able to naturally fit into that zone. Buster Rhymes is, I mean, he's a rapper. He's, he's not an actor. And he's likely to, and, and that was his character too. His character was silly like that. So, you know, I mean, it's not like with a different actor. Like that is what Buster, that's what Freddie was. He was that guy. He was just silly and stupid and that was it. So, you know, if they had written him differently to be different, then I think he probably would have acted different and acted more serious for sure. Um, but in, in, your, in the sense of your example, Halloween Resurrection, I, I think it's probably just down to the writing, really. They, they wrote this really wacky, silly character and they let just Busta Rhymes be Busta Rhymes. Um, because that was his character. You know, it's not like Busta Rhymes was like, if Busta Rhymes had been cast as Dr. Loomis and he was acting like that, well, then that's the director's fault, right? You know what I'm saying? But in terms of Freddy specifically, it's probably just how the character was written <laughs> in my opinion anyway. But I would say generally, it's probably a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Um... Ba, 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 bum. Let me see here. Yeah, Flick Symmetry says Busta was just doing his thing. I'm sure they knew what they were getting, but 
the name recognition probably helping opening night and that's it. Oh, for sure. hundred percent. That's, that's exactly what it was all about. Name recognition, just a bunch of dog shit, shitty shit, shitty shits. Um, just closing some things here. There you guys are. Uh, so what did you, I, I haven't seen anybody really like, what did you guys think of the exorcist trailer? Number two. Like, just the trailer itself. Did you like it better than the first trailer? Did you like the first trailer better than the second trailer? Or did you hate both trailers equally? Or did you like both trailers equally? And if you're watching after the fact, make sure to jump into the comment section and let me know uh, your thoughts about that as well. Hey, Brooke Scarlet and Maga. Great to see you guys here. Lee, the machine bowers. By the way, Lee, I did get your Instagram message and that's, that's really cool. That's really cool. I had no idea. That, I mean, it's fandom created, right? Based on like a comic or something. I get that, whatever, you know what I mean? But that's still cool. That's still good. But you know what? It's the whole Charlie Bowles thing we're talking about. I tell you, that was a great episode. It was a great episode. Uh, dark, man. Dark shit. <sighs> Lots of ways you could go with that, Lee. Lots of ways you could go with that. Mike Mick, Mike MC, Mike Mick says, I am excited for the movie. The first trailer is better. Like I said, I don't expect to be hit at 53 by a movie uh, like I was when I was 10. Uh, that's, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. And that's a good, that's a good mindset to have when you're going in, right? That's a really good mindset to have when you're going in. And, uh, and I agree with that. I agree with that. As long as it is abiding by the, um, the canonical DNA tissue of that first movie. Do you know what I'm saying? And then I think as long as people can walk out going, you know what? Listen, there's always going to be people saying that it's an absolute dumpster fire. It's the worst movie of all time. Um, if they can slip woke in there, I'm sure they will. Uh, even though I don't see anything woke about the trailer. Um, but you know, it's a buzzword now. So people like to toss it around. Um, but I think for the most part, if audiences can walk away going, you know, that was all right. That was pretty good. You know, it's not going to win any awards. I think it was the greatest movie of all time, but it, 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 it surpassed my expectations and I was pleased. It was kind of creepy and I had a good time. Then that's all. Is that not all we can ask for? Like in this day and age, isn't it not true that all we can ask for in this day and age, if you think about it, especially when it comes to a legacy sequel to a sequel that has such an emotional, nostalgic, built-in fan base that is revered in the genre as one of the greatest of all time, uh, the granddaddy of its subgenre, the granddaddy of its subgenre. Correct me if I'm wrong, people, but isn't the very like? Shouldn't our expectations just be at like, hey, I hope it's pretty good. Like, why are we, like, oh, it's a rhetorical question. I understand why. But why do we put so much weight into that it has to be this or it's shit, right? I agree that it cannot, it, it should not, and we hope it's not a dumpster fire and that it insults the intelligence of the viewers and shits on the original and somehow recreates and redefines the DNA and does weird, dumb things that make no sense and whatever the case is there. I agree that it should not do that a hundred percent. But if we can walk away from the movie going, that was like as far as legacy, as far as 2023, the expectations, the boots they needed to fill. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, it was, it was all right. It was actually pretty good. Like I had a good time. I, that's kind of where I am. And that kind of sounds like where you are too, right? Like it's kind of like, no, I mean, it's, I mean, listen, if it ends up being amazing, that's, that's great. But I'm hoping for just pretty good you know, uh, good, like good. I'm, I'm hoping for good. Like I said, a six and a half, seven out of 10. That's really good for a modern day horror movie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying it ain't too often that the horror sub or the horror genre, uh, you know, gets anything above a six, six and a half on, on, you know, Rotten Tomatoes, right? And get pretty crazy in there. Pretty crazy in there.
Um, Corey392 says, missed Dave. Missed, missed me or did I miss a super chat? I mean, you mean missed me. You knocked it out of the park as Freddie and DNN. Awesome job, bro. Thanks, man. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was, uh, I'm really glad. Obviously, you can't please everybody, right? You know, there are people out there. Rah, 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 I hate Freddie. He was fucking dog shit. No, Robert, 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 Robert. I also, uh, there's also the, the um, uh, it feels like there's this manufactured feud that some people want to create between myself and uh, Paul Bailey. And uh, I've never met Paul. I've never talked to Paul. I started following him, though, and he followed me back. And And we've exchanged a couple of uh, YouTube comments. Seems like a really nice guy. Really talented guy. Like, my God. the ma- Have you seen his makeup? Like, like, like the Freddy 2 makeup video and shit? It's fucking spectacular. He 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 made that, sculpted it, made it, applied it himself. He applied it to himself. It's wild. He looks spectacular. It looks fucking amazing. It looks fantastic. He just did a Hall- uh, Halloween Elm Street uh, fan film where he applied um, prosthetics on his face. He's, he's really talented uh, to make his nose look more like a young Robert's nose. His Elm Street fan film was really cool. Um, re- really, really talented dude. But it's the internet is so funny how, you know, you have like Paul Bailey fans, right? Oh, fuck Dave McRae. Oh, Paul Bailey should be the next Freddy Krueger. And I'm like, all right. You know what I'm saying? And then you got people like, oh, fuck Paul Bailey. Dave McRae should be. It's like, guys, we, like, you, I don't have anything against Paul. Paul doesn't have anything. We don't, they, I don't, it's weird. It's uh, the internet. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, Paul's fucking great. Yeah, you know, Paul's really great, you know? And I'm like, yeah, he's great. <laughs> like, well, he looks more like Freddie than you do, you know? Okay. I mean, it's, oh, oh, he looks fantastic. I, there's an argument to be made there. You know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm just like this, 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 this manufactured outrage that people are trying to create, but it happens all the time, right? They, they would love it if Paul and I were like, fuck you, Dave. No, fuck you, Paul. Yeah. You want to have a Freddy off? It's like, guys, that's not going to happen. We're, we're adults and we're professionals and we don't do that. Um, <laughs> it's just so funny. Anyway, shout out to Paul Bailey because one talented motherfucker for sure. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so, but the feedback to my performance and to the Freddy that I was given to do, uh, has been, has been fantastic. And, and, um, I just, again, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you who have, uh, expressed your, uh, love and appreciation for what I was able to do with the character and what I brought to the table in the short amount of time that I had. Again, it's a short film. I'm not on screen a lot. Um, so I didn't have a lot of time to play and a lot of room to wiggle and play and show, show my stuff. Um, I'm hoping I can have that opportunity in the future. Maybe even officially just saying, I t- Hey, like I said, that's a phone call I take. Um, do I believe I could do it officially? A hundred percent. Yes, for sure. Uh, will it happen? One can dream one who knows one can dream. Right. Um, but nonetheless, even in the sequel to Dylan's new nightmare, which I hope they end up doing. Um, I have no say in that again, guys, I'm not a producer on it. It's not my fan film. It's from that perspective, writing, directing, producing. I had nothing to do with that. Um, so I have no say whether there's a sequel or not. So, um, I hope Cecil wants to do one and hopefully in the sequel, they can raise enough money where they can shoot the whole thing, you know, like a feature and I'll have a lot more time to wiggle and move and, and play and really show you what I can do. But in the, in the short time that I was able to show you some things, uh, the feedback has been really, really great. And again, you always have people like, "Mm, he sucks, Robert, Mm, Robert, Robert only. And I get that totally. I get it. Um, but for the most part, uh, the feedback has been really positive, and I've seen a lot of articles written about my portrayal, which has been great, and it's really resonant. I think it, I think it's surprising a lot of people. I, th- I think there's two things. I think I think there's people that watch me here on the channel that know me uh, as as uh, here on the channel, um, and were surprised by that I was able to do that. But again, I've been a professional for a long time in the industry. So I knew what I was capable of. Um, and, uh, and I just did my thing. I did my thing that I always do before YouTube even existed. So, um, and then I think there's people that were generally surprised that there was somebody that could deliver a performance that was, wow, that, that made them really sort of 
not forget Robert, but kind of made them realize that maybe there is somebody else out there that could do it. And that's what I've said too. I said, listen, <laughs> you know, that's the dream, right? To get an, a, a real shot at being him. That's the dream. But the probability is always against you just because the competition is so fierce and you don't know what direction the studio is going to want to go in and, and what they have in terms of the vision for the character and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but what's cool is, is that I hope at the very least, as I've said publicly on social media, I hope very least that if this is the only time I play him, that I was able to at least show, you know, the world, quote unquote, uh, that another actor can do it and, and, and do it justice, right? Do it justice to the point where you go, okay, all right, you know what? Okay, maybe it's not a lost cause like so many people are hyperbolic over. Nobody will ever be able to play. No, no one ever, you know, and I don't believe that's true at all. And Robert Englund doesn't believe that's true. So um, hopefully what I was able to do, I, as I said, at the very least, shows that it can happen and that maybe who, if it's not me, whoever the actor is that's hired to play him, uh, people will be like, well, you know what? Let's give this guy a chance because look what Dave McRae did in that. And you know, you never know this guy, like, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, that's, you know, hopefully if that's my legacy to Freddie, that's a pretty cool legacy if you think about it. Um, but would I, would I absolutely jump at the opportunity to, to uh, to talk to somebody and to audition or, or or to to have an opportunity to to play him in a in a canon film, hundred percent. Of course I would, you know, or a series or whatever. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but it was it was a lot of fun. It was fun to play. It was fun to play and lose myself in the character and uh, and really showcase what I can do. So again, thank you to everybody out there who has come forward and 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 uh, and said that you know what, dude. You did awesome. Uh, I didn't think I would, you know, and there's been a lot of people that have come forward and said, I was an, I was a Robert only guy and you actually changed my mind. That's wild. Cause some of those Robert only people are like, they're like vultures. <laughs> um, Hey, Robert's the goat, man. He's, he's the, I, I get it. I totally get it. He's the goat. But it, but if the goat even says there can be another Freddy, I mean, I think we got to at least, you know, entertain it. You got to entertain him. Okay, uh, how much time we got? Uh, I'll go a little bit longer. It was a super chat I saw here. It came in from Jordan Ellis. Hey, Jordan, what's going on, buddy? Sends in a dollar ninety nine. One of our great channel members here. I can tell you've been a channel member for over a month now because you have the the uh, Reagan uh, um, uh, badge there, which is cool. Uh, much love, Dave. Much love right back at you, Jordan. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um. Let me see here. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Dilly dilly dilly. Alex Shambach says, who is Paul Bailey? He's he's an actor and effects artist. Uh, he's got a great video online. Again, it's just him sort of messing about, you know, looking at the camera, doing things like this and all. But the makeup is spectacular. And he did it himself. It's spect it's Elm Street 2 makeup. And he he's a sculptor and effects artist. He sculpted this mold. He painted it. He applied it. That's what gets me. Having Nora do what she did to me, I can't even imagine applying that to me. Now, I don't know if Paul had help or if he had like, if he sat in a room full of mirrors. I, I, I don't know. But dude, like, that's wild. Uh, really, really talented guy, uh, certainly in that sense. Um, and uh, yeah, he's, he looks he looks like, you know, because, because the makeup is so good. You know what I mean? He looks like Robert from part two in this in this like two minute sort of thing where he's showing off his work. And I'm like, dude, if I, if I could fucking do that, I'd be showing off my work like that too. It looks, looks really good. Looks really good. In terms of the Elm Street too. Now again, the Freddy makeup in DNN, of course, was modeled after several looks. Right, so uh, it was modeled after the Elm Street Two look with the sunken in eyes. It was modeled after the Demon Freddy from Freddy vs Jason. So when you look at my ears and all that, and the brow, how, how the brow is like like this, you know what I mean? Uh, that was modeled after the Demon Freddy in Freddy vs Jason. And then some of the patchwork and burn mark was modeled after Freddy from New Nightmare. So there were three looks to Freddy in Dylan's new nightmare. It was like a hodgepodge of a couple of different looks. And, um, and I think, I think they did it again. Shout out to Mikey Rotella and Nora Hewitt, who just fucking knocked it out of the park. It just looks spectacular. You know what I mean? I mean, look, there's some people that didn't like the makeup because they're like, Oh, there's something wrong. It's like, well, it's not wrong. It's just, 
it's just not, it's a hodgepodge of a couple of Freddy looks. It's professionally sculpted, professionally molded, professionally painted, professionally applied. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's total pro. It's just maybe not what you, you didn't, maybe you're not crazy on the design. That's totally fair, right? To be like, I'm not crazy on the design. That's totally fair. But it wasn't an amateur job. I, I can tell you that I was in the fucking makeup chair for five hours, four times. So I can tell you that you know, (laughs) trust me, it was the real deal, uh, the real deal. But, um, but yeah, but I like what they did for my look. I think it's really cool. And I think with, with, with more room to play for me to be able to kind of show off what I can do again, that short film, there's only so much I can do, right? If I can, if they can raise enough money for the sequel and shoot a feature, uh, or if I get cast officially or, you know, whatever, uh, again, the dream, that's the dream. But, um, but even in a sequel to DNN, if I could have more room to play and show what I can do and get, oh, dude, I, I can't say too much, but I know some of the ideas they want to do for part two, if they ever get a chance to do it. And whew, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen, in terms of Freddy and my standoff with Miko, and you, you, you ain't seen nothing yet. Like, it's just, you know, again, especially with something like Freddy, when you want to do it right, it costs a lot of money. And because you're talking about the dream world and the effects and the makeup, it's not like it's me, Billy, which still costs a lot of money. But, you know, Cecil's probably going to have to raise like, you know, four or $500,000. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, you know, when you want to do it right and you want to go all out, um, cause don't forget to shoot a feet, like just to put me in the makeup, you know, five, six, 10 more times is thousands of dollars. And I don't mean paying me. I mean, thousands of dollars in prosthetics and, you know, and, and the molds and the, you know, all that kind of shit. Right. So it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. But uh, again, uh, not to go off on a big DNN, uh, uh, um, rant here, but not rant, but, you know, uh, talk, but again, I, I do really appreciate, uh, the feedback. I'm glad that it's my Freddie has been resonating with people and people really like it. It's funny. There, there's some people that, that, that have said that I've seen pe- some people say that, uh, I like the movie. Freddie was great, but I thought this was going to be the dark Freddie and that he wasn't going to be comical. And I'm like, but I am dark. Like, yes, I agree that the, you know, what's up doc. I agree that <laughs> I agree. That's, that's, that's probably the funniest I get in the movie. Uh, what's up, Doc? Right? Um, but I still think, in my opinion, anyway, I still think my portrayal of Freddy... Hey, it's not like I'm Freddy's dead Freddy. All right? Like, I mean, you know, power glove. You know? I mean, I mean, great graphics. I mean, it's... it's, it's oh, no screaming while the bus is in motion. You know, I mean, it's... That's... Like, that's what I consider ridiculous, right? Even in the original Elm Street there's a little bit of tongue in cheek with him, right? Like when he's like, Tina, and he comes out, you know, from behind the tree and he's like, watch this. And then it's like, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, ha, ha, ha. and he's looking at her like this. I mean, you know, that, that there's a little bit of kind of tongue in cheek to him. Uh, you know, when he's running down the alley like this and, and um, I get what people are saying though. I think maybe the what's up doc, they was a little too, maybe it took them out of it maybe. But I think overall, uh, I think it is a, darker, darker version of Freddy than we got in uh, Freddy's Dead or even in even in like part five as well. I think some of the the sort of uh, uh, approach that I had, um, because again, it's it's you can deliver it. I don't mind if Freddy delivers a joke, but there's got to be an ironic darkness to it. You know, do you know what I mean? It's got the the scene still has to play very dark and disturbing. And, um, but again, I didn't write the movie, right? So if people have issues with that, you got to take that up with the writer. I didn't write it. Um, you know, I was, I was, uh, I was hired to do a role and I did. And, and, uh, and so far it's hit with a lot of people and, and I really appreciate that. Um, all right, my channel member, what do we got? Uh, Cody Snyder, member for one month, McCrazy level number two. Thank you for all the awesome community. That is right. Hey, that's right. Yeah, you've been a member for a month. That's right, Cody. Well, Cody, you're one of our great moderators here, one of our great, awesome moderators here. So thank you so, so much. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, let me scroll back here and see uh, what do we got. I got all the emojis there from Cody. I love it. I love the dog shit emoji too. It's fantastic. The dog shit emoji. 
Um, let's see here. Scrolling, scrolling. What do we got? Uh, oh, you know what? I'll go another like 10 minutes and then we'll call it. Another 10 minutes and we'll call it. Uh, Blair Hathaway says, hey, was there anyone in the chat almost two or three years ago remember the person that accidentally donated 300 Super Chat? That wasn't two or three years ago, Blair. That was last year. Yeah, that was last year. Uh, e either last year or the end of the previous year. So uh, I don't think it was two years ago, though. But yes, I remember that. They accidentally donated uh, $300 and they were able to get it back. See, I have no control over that. Right. So you can't. So if you ask, so it was, it was crazy. So when you donate, I have like, I don't, I don't, it doesn't go to me right away. It gets paid to me once a month. And, uh, but what you can do, what I read online is that if you accidentally donated $300 and I told this person, you got to contact, here's the link, here's who you contact, here's what you put forward, but you got to do it right away because if you don't do it right away, it's going to make it more. And they're going to be like, mm, I don't know. Did you really? I don't know. Cause they can verify, oh, this person says they made a mistake. They donated a large amount of money by accident and they donated on the day that they're asking for it back. Yeah, it probably was a mistake. But if you're like, mm, I want that $300 back and it was six months ago, yeah, you're not going to get it back. It's not going to happen. Um, so you got to, if you accidentally do donate a large sum, you got to be right on it. And I told him this, He, I, I told him to reach out to me. He reached out to me. I gave him the link to YouTube and everything and he was able to get it back, which is awesome. I was really happy for him. So yeah, I do remember that. That was, that was, that was crazy. That was crazy. Um, all right. Have I missed any super chats though? I don't think, oh wait, yes I did. Cody Snyder gifted a membership. Oh, that's who, that's what happened. He gifted a membership to Evil Alex. Amazing. Welcome aboard, Evil. Welcome aboard. Nice to see you here. Thank you for doing that, Cody. Really appreciate that. Um, Arthur Vega sends in $10. Thank you, Arthur. And says, hey, Dave, I agree. Another actor can play Freddy. hundred percent. I'm curious, uh, could the same be said about characters like Ernest P. Worrell and Pee Wee Herman? Um... I don't, well, I'll tell you, is it possible? Yes, yes, of course it's possible, yes, um, because they are characters, and uh, could there be somebody out there that could that could do Pee Wee Herman, right? Play Pee Wee Herman, look like, I mean, look at all those Michael Jackson impersonators that you sometimes see that look so much like him, that are dancing like him, doing all the fucking moves, just as good as MJ, right? So is it possible now could they sing like him could they actually sing like michael jackson probably not right they're lip syncing to his songs um but is there are there actors out there that okay, let's take Wee herman right is there an actor out there that could that could do Wee herman you know ha ha wow like all that stuff but but kind of looks like him do the haircut really like the person become Wee herman yes there is would we accept it? And is it, should we do that? Probably not. Pee Wee Herman is very much sort of a, a staple of a different era and a pop culture icon from a certain era. And I don't think it's necessary to revive Pee Wee Herman in any sort of realistic, authentic way where we've hired an actor to do a Pee Wee Herman movie. I, 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 don't, I don't think that's necessary. And the same goes with Ernest, right? I don't think it's really necessary. Um, but do I think that there is somebody else out there on the face of the planet who could do it? Yes, I do. Uh, who are they? Where are they? Will we, will we, will we ever know about them? Who knows? Um, but I don't think they're going to do that. I don't think they're going to do that. It's a good question though. It's a good question. Um, all right. I don't think I've missed any super chats. I just want to make sure. Uh, and again, thank you, Cody, for, um, for doing that. I really appreciate that very much. Um, back over here. Uh, oh yeah. Next Gen Studio says, are you looking forward to Thanksgiving, Dave? I think it looks pretty cool. Yes. You know what? Maybe I'll save my thoughts on that for another McRae live. Um, but I am, I am, uh, that's the short answer. I want to save that because I might save it for a, a topic. Um, yeah, it's funny. Um, when Lynn, I've told this before, but for those who may not know, Lynn Griffith 
Lynn Griffin, excuse me, who was in the original Black Christmas. She was Claire, the one with the bag overhead. She is also starring in It's Me, Billy, Chapter 2. She doesn't play Claire because she's dead. So she plays Claire's sister. Uh, but when we, uh, when I reached out to Lynn, because we, we were Facebook friends, because um, we also have the same voiceover agent, which is, again, small world. Um, so we had something in common beyond just Black Christmas. So anyway, when I reached out to her to ask her if I could speak with her about coming on to It's Me, Billy, Chapter 2, because she really loved Chapter 1, um, she had sent me a message back saying, hey, I would love to talk to you about this. I'm just in the middle of talking with Eli Roth on the set of Thanksgiving, because that was shot up here. It was shot up here near uh, Port, I think it was Port Perry. I think it's where they shot it. So that drone shot you see in the trailer, uh, I know where that is. I know where that town is. I've been there. It's about an hour from here. And uh, hour and a bit. And uh, so I, I I got this message back and I'm like, wow, that's really fucking cool. I'm like, yeah, take your time. No worries at all. So anyway, I think it was the next day or the day after she reached out and, and we had a Zoom call and, and and talked about that. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, and I think she even mentioned it's me, Billy, to Eli Roth, if I'm not mistaken, which is equally fucking cool. But anyway, Thanksgiving, yes. Um, I want to save it though. I want to save it. I want to save it. Uh, all right, couple more minutes, couple more minutes left in the show, couple more minutes left in the show. Chester Franklin Jr. says, Dave, did you know that the comments, there is super thanks in the comments section. Anyone can get super thanks. Yep. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You can do that. I don't, can you do that now or do you have to wait till the stream is done? I'm not sure, but yes. Yeah. I've gotten a couple of super thanks. Uh, not many, but you know, two or three I've gotten. Um, all right, scrolling back, scrolling back. Uh, okay, no, I got that. I got that. I got that. Um, Ian David Strain says, I'm calling it a night. Stay cool. Take care, Ian. Take care, buddy. Thanks. Thanks for stopping by and hanging out for a bit. Um, Harry Hagen says, I always say, don't remake a movie or a character. Just do your own version of it. Just like uh, Jalil, Jaleel White. Is that how you say that? I know. He, yeah. The J, Jaleel White said Urkel was his version of Pee Wee or how the Matrix is the Wachowski's version of the Terminator. Hey, that's a great example. That's actually a really cool idea. Um, that's actually very smart. And yeah, you so you get sort of like you you draw the parallels. You 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 can kind of see you you get it, you see it for sure, but um but you avoid that, you know, that competition, that nostalgic emotional competition with the fans necessarily. Um, all right, folks. Well, listen, that's going to do it for this episode of McCray Live. Thank you to my amazing moderators. Of, of, of course, you know who you are. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing what you guys do. I really appreciate it. Thank you to my channel members um, as well. Really appreciate that. Remember, if you want to become a channel member here on the channel, the link is pinned to the top of the chat. It's also in, in the description. And also the It's Me Billy Chapter 2 campaign is in the description as well. Pick up those Blu-rays, folks. I want to do that Halloween stream for you. We're, we're cutting it close. We're cutting it close. We got to get it done. Get her done. We got to get it done. The two associate producer perks and the um, uh, the uh, double blue perk, which is now featured on the campaign, to a total of two hundred, uh, total of three hundred three. Let's do it. I believe in this community. I believe we can do it. I know we can. Uh, thank you, of course, for tuning in. Hey, if you're watching after the fact, jump into the comment section. Let me know your thoughts on the Exodus Believer trailer number two. Did it hit right with you? Did it hit right with you? Let me know. I'm not saying the movie's going to be good, but for whatever reason, I got to be honest with you. You know I always am. I like the trailer better than the first trailer. I totally see all the... I get it. I get it. I get it. But I, I liked it better than the first trailer. I, don't know, I guess I'm... Am I losing my mind? I don't know. But hey, I got to be honest with you. You always know I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, hey, Cody gifted another membership to Ian David Strain. Amazing. Welcome, Ian. Awesome, awesome stuff. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, folks, have a great rest of your Monday. Uh, I hope you're, you know, you're hanging in out there, wherever you are. And uh, I will talk to you all soon. All righty. In the meantime, but in between time, cheers. <laughs>